Suppose a woman is vested proclaiming the gospel in St. Peter's Basilica. How does that help the mission of the church? What does that say about women? What does that say about what the church says about women worldwide? That women once served as deacons in the early church is widely acknowledged by scholars today. But how was the role of deacon understood? And why did the practice of ordaining women to the diaconate fade by the 12th century? A leading expert in the field is Dr. Phyllis Sagano, who was appointed to the Pope's new commission to study the matter in 2016. Her books are essential reading, and we'll look at three of them to discover women deacons today on Subject Matters. Phyllis Lugano, welcome to our show. It's wonderful to have you Thank on. Thank you. Thank you. Now, in your books, you make a very important distinction, especially between the question of ordaining women to the diaconate and ordaining women to the priesthood. And that very often when we talk about this question of women deacons, it blurs into this question of women priests. But let's start there. Why is that a very important distinction to make? Well. I, I don't talk really about the priesthood. I talk about women deacons. Women deacons are not women priests, and uh, the diaconate is not the priesthood. That's, that's very clear uh, in canon law, in the catechism, that the, the, priest is, the deacon is ordained to the ministry, not to the priesthood. Um, in the ancient church, the, the deacon worked for the bishop, the priest worked for the bishop. Uh, but uh, because there were no seminaries, if you needed to find another bishop, you generally went to the deacon to become the bishop. As life went on, the church developed um, what's called the cursus honorum, the, the course of honor developed. So you, first you were a deacon, then you were a priest, then you were a bishop. Now, if you fast forward to around the 12th century, you find that the diaconate has really died out as a permanent ministry. Anybody who is going to be ordained as a deacon is destined for the priesthood. So they basically stopped ordaining women as deacons because women couldn't be priests. And that's the case today, that um, the church has fairly definitively said women can't be, can't be priests. Right. Uh, but the church has restored the diaconate as a permanent, uh, permanent uh, vocation. And only recently, in the last 50 years, right? Well, on June 18th, uh, 1967 is when uh, the norms were published. It was the Feast of St. Ephraim at, uh, at the time. And um, the diaconate was revived as a permanent uh, st a state of, of, of the clergy, a permanent vocation. So having said that, now you have a whole cadre of ministers who are not destined to be priests. Uh, there are now something like 42, 45,000 in the world, hmm. mostly married men. Some of them are religious, some of them are celibate, some of them are, I mean, most of them are married, as I said. And, and, and they work in ministry. They are not destined to the priesthood. So, so the question of women deacons becoming women pre, it, it never was, and I, I don't think it ever will be. Hmm. Uh, but I also say that there's really nothing um, that I have found that mitigates against women being, being deacons, being ordained as deacons for ministry. Right. One of the things that comes out in your books is um, just the extent of the history there is, uh, the historical evidence oh. of women deacons, you know, and uh, that's fascinating to me. Um, tell us, I mean, in a nutshell, what do we need to know about the history of women deacons? Because a lot of Catholics, I feel like, don't know that there is this substantial evidence that they, yes, they were there. They were there in the early church. They were there throughout. Well, we, we have a lot of evidence about women, women deacons. We have their tombstones. They're called deacons. We have literary evidence. They're called deacons. We have ordination ceremonies where women are ordained as deacons. Uh, we have descriptions of what they did, and they are deacon things. You know, mm -hmm. if they weren't deacons, they would have been called something else. So, um, for the first, uh, really, several hundred years of the, of the church, um, bishops, if they saw the need, 
um, would consecrate, ordain, appoint. You know, you have all sorts of language going on in the, in the early church. But we do have evidence of women deacons ordained by the laying on of hands inside the sanctuary, inside the altar rail, during a liturgy, and the, the formula for the ordination included what's called an epiclesis, included the calling down of the Holy Spirit. Right. So I think it's disingenuous. I don't think it's a good idea to um, impugn the, the veracity of the ordaining bishop. He didn't know what he was doing you know, when he ordained. That's one thing you'll hear. Right. Uh, the other is because it's a female, it didn't take. Right. I mean, you're, you're telling me that the Holy Spirit said, I can't do it, it's a girl? I mean, this, this is crazy stuff. <laughs> Um, the, the church did not see that kind of a distinction. Mm -hmm. After the, uh, the, the, the schism, we found the diaconate maintained in the Eastern churches. We found the female diaconate maintained in the Eastern churches. There are, there are ch Eastern churches, Orthodox churches today, that either ordained or have voted to ordain women to the diaconate. Uh, and we recognize their sacrament and order. Mm -hmm. Now, our church has said nothing about the, these women. Are they ordained, really ordained or not. Uh, but, but the fact is that tr the tradition has perdured. We have evidence of uh, popes, in fact, uh, in the 18th century complaining about women, the, the Greek women uh, in Sicily, uh, assisting at the altar. Well, if <laughs> they're complaining about it, then you know they're doing it. Right. And they're not doing it without the priest's permission. Right. You know, you don't right. have uh, hordes of women running up and jumping over the altar rail or behind the iconostasis. So, so, so we, we have a lot of evidence that, that women were ordained, that they ministered doing deacon things as deacons. Uh, they were recognized as deacons. Uh, they were buried as deacons. Uh, and uh, it's just a vocation that died out really as a permanent, uh, permanent vocation in the West. So considering where we are now with you know, the, the, the restoration of the permanent diaconate mm -hmm. for men, and as right. you said, married men since, since Vatican II, um, and the, considering what you said about the difference between the question of ordination right. for priesthood and ordination for, for the diaconate, what is the argument against ordaining sure. women deacons today? Sure. Is there a valid argument? My mind is they're taking the argument against women priests and trying to transplant it to the diaconate. You know, in 1976, uh, Ordinatio Sacerdotalis, the opinion of the Congregation with the Doctrine of the Faith about women priests said, women cannot image Christ, the iconic argument, and uh, Jesus only chose male apostles, the argument from authority. Well, now you get to 1994 uh, with Ordinatio Sacerdotalis and the iconic argument is gone. So John Paul didn't restate what the CDF had said. What in he 19. did say is Jesus chose male apostles. The church does not have the authority to ordain women as priests. Both of those documents specifically left the priesthood, uh, the, the diaconate aside. Right. Both of those documents. And uh, when you go to the dubium, you know, uh, the answer is, is this, this to be held definitively? And the answer is yes, it's to be held definitively. Well then to me, that's really the last argument against women deacons. Because if you believe that a woman cannot be ordained a priest, then what is your problem with women deacons? Right. Uh, uh, there's the, the, again, I, I'd go back, the, the problem is the, this course of honor that people think if you can be ordained a deacon, you can be ordained a priest. Well, if you use that argument against the ordination of women as deacons, if you can be ordained a deacon, then you can be ordained a priest. That works in the reverse. We know women were ordained as deacons. Right. So then you're telling me women can be ordained as priests. Right. You know? But the yeah. church says women cannot be ordained as priests. So if women cannot be ordained as priests, what's your problem with deacons? Right, right. We have to take a short break, but we'll be back with much more from Phyllis Sagano, and we'll be asking her about the Papal Commission that is now studying this question of women in the diaconate. We'll get as much as she's willing to talk about it, so stay with us. Phyllis Sagano is Senior Research Associate in Residence and Adjunct Professor of Religion at Hofstra University and is founding co-chair of the Roman Catholic Studies Group of the American Academy of Religion. She's an acclaimed Catholic scholar and lecturer on contemporary spirituality and women's issues in the church and is considered one of the leading experts on the study of women deacons. In August 2016, she was appointed by Pope Francis to a special commission to study the question of women deacons. Phyllis is the author or editor of 18 books, and she writes a regular column that is published in the National Catholic Reporter. 
the question of why the ordination of women is good and necessary becomes, what will ordination say about the nature of the church and the exercise of ministry? In too many quarters, the Catholic Church is derided and despised for its perceived views of women. The entire laundry list of so-called women's issues clouds the crying need of the people of God for ministry by women. Phyllis, I want to ask you about uh, the question of authority or governance in the church. I think some people are afraid, clerics I think for the most part, men, uh, that if you open up the diaconate to women, women are now in the clerical state, therefore women have greater authority in the church and that might be dangerous. Do you, do you see that as a valid fear? Well, don't blame it only on the men, but I, I th <laughs> you know, there's words you're, you're using here. Um, John Paul said that the church don't have the authority to ordain women as priests, but when, when you talk about the clerical state, you're talking about uh, entrance into governance and jurisdiction. But the deacon has no governance or jurisdiction except mm. as it is delegated, given to him by the priest or by the bishop. Uh, the deacon does not go out preaching in the neighborhood unless he has faculties from the bishop. The deacon does not witness a marriage in a parish without the permission of the pastor. It's a delegated, um, delegated authority, if you will. Um, so, so anything that the deacon does as a cleric, for example, only, only a cleric may be a single signer of a judgment. And, and as you know, in December... Like in a marriage tribunal exactly, or something. Exactly. Okay. In December of 2015, they said, uh, uh, one judge, no second instance. Right. Well, what is a woman canon lawyer judge going to do, except if she writes the finding, run down the hall and get a cleric to sign it? Now, the cleric who signs it is doing it the authority or the, uh, the, the jurisdiction is delegated by the, the bishop. The person who signs it does not have this kind of jurisdiction or ability, mm -hmm. really. It's only something that is given, uh, given by the bishop. So, so the business of authority, um, what I about, think, what, what about the case? There's a wrong word there. Yeah. Okay, what about the case of, of uh, a, a cardinal deacon? Oh, you yeah. know, for example, uh, having a woman deacon be elevated to cardinal so okay. that they could participate in a conclave. Is that possible? Because I think historically not all of the cardinals have been priests, bishops, cardinals, right? Well, right now with the new code of canon law, one must be at least a bishop, uh, at least a priest okay. uh, to be, but that's new and that's law. I mean, it's a merely ecclesiastical law. It could be uh, given a waiver or derogated from. So in the, in the 19th century, we have two men uh, who were um, working in the Vatican, they were, they were laymen, and they were made cardinals, and they were made deacons. They were two cardinal deacons. Um, some people argue, well, that's interesting, lay cardinals, and other people argue, well, no, these are real cardinal deacons. Mm. Um, I think it would be easy uh, for the, uh, uh, the church to, to receive cardinal deacons, uh, women, because mm -hmm. um, a cardinal is really an advisor to the pope. Yeah. Um, uh, he's the senior staffer, you know, usually the head of a courier, courier office is, is a cardinal. Well, there's nothing um, sacramental involved with running an office, right. you know, but the, 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 the name cardinal uh, to the hinge, you know, the hinge, the, the person who is the advisor to the Pope, I think it would be very, very interesting if they would uh, bring about cardinals, but it would be easier to have a cardinal deacon. Mm. Uh, now, when you talk about conclaves and electing, then you're bringing more of the church into the church if you have a cardinal deacon as an elector. Right. I mean, uh, she'd be the one, last one online because she'd be the most <laughs> junior cardinal deacon. But, uh, and, and then, of course, that kind of begs the question, would she be eligible to be elected pope? Right. And uh, the answer is probably not. I have to ask you about the papal commission that, that you've been appointed to is August of 2016 that Francis announced that he would be studying this question yes. officially. Uh, women deacons in the Catholic Church. Uh, what was your reaction to the announcement that Francis was calling this commission and then the announcement that you were appointed by him to be on it? Well, the reaction was pretty interesting because uh, your boss, Tom Rosica, sent me an email and it was an Italian uh, press release, which I was like, great, there's a, they're naming people <laughs> and I'm reading it and it's in alphabetical order and the last name is me. So I was like, oh my goodness. 
So I, uh, uh, I was not dressed for media, I can tell you that. <laughs> and uh, I ran over to the, press, to the press office, the public affairs officer at the university, and I said, I know you're busy with the Trump-Clinton debate, but uh, I just got named to a papal commission. <laughs> <laughs> and a friend of mine brought up some clothes, and I did two and a half days of media after that, and then stopped. Um, I was surprised. Um, I, I didn't know anybody else. Uh, I began to look into who else was on the commission. Just fascinating, wonderful people from Belgium, a, psych a Jesuit psychologist who's an ecclesiologist, you know, uh, from Vienna, uh, a woman who's a consecrated virgin, a specialist in spirituality, yeah. and can translate from Latin to German. You know, um, scripture scholars, patristic scholars, ecclesiologists, uh, uh, people in, in dogmatic theology, um, from not all over the world. There's one guy from Rwanda who's lived in, in Rome for 20 years. There's another American who's lived in Rome for 20 years. I'm the only person coming from outside Europe, actually. Uh, but uh, scholars uh, uh, who, you know, when I looked into their works, very, very serious scholars, none of whom really, except for one, has done much work on the diaconate. <laughs> Or oh, the diaconate of women, so that, that I was kind of surprised because when I, I looked down at folks' books, mine kind of stood out a little bit. <laughs> so, so what can you tell us? I mean, is there, is it a, is it a constructive dialogue that's going on? Is there progress being made? I mean, what, what can you tell us? Well, you know, constructive and progress. I can't speak about the uh, the commission. I, I really can't say anything about the commission. Uh, I've been asked uh, not to speak publicly, not to give public lectures to this date. I've turned down 30 invitations for public lectures since I was named to the commission. Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think that's wise uh, because the, the work of the commission is, is at the request of the Holy Father. So that's what I can tell you. They're fabulous people. Uh, we've met a couple of times. I don't know what will happen in the future. Uh, I don't know if anything will happen in the future. So, um, you know, I, I really don't know. <laughs> it's just, I've been asked to go to Rome, I've been asked to uh, do some things, and I've been doing some things, and uh, we'll just see what happens. All right, well, we have a guest reviewer today, as always. Luke Hansen is here, he's a Jesuit priest and a theology student, and he is very interested in this topic as well. Here's his review, Luke. Thank you, Dr. Zagano, for your tireless efforts to bring greater light and understanding to the history of women deacons in the church, to help us to under, better understand our own history as a church, and to help us explore the possibility of women again serving as deacons in the church today. A year ago, uh, this collection of essays was published on women deacons. Dr. Zagano is the editor, uh, Women Deacons, Essays with Answers. And it was published one year ago on April 28th. And providentially, just two weeks later, uh, Pope Francis agreed to establish the Papal Commission to study women deacons. So right now, this book is timely and essential reading for anyone who wants to learn more about the topic. There is a consensus among these authors that these women deacons were sacramentally ordained, and they could be today. Um, and they marshal strong argument, arguments in favor of that thesis. Uh, but they're also uh, meticulous in their arguments and nuanced. And they also point out the complexity and the contradictions that exist within the historical record. So for instance, in some places, women deacons were counted as being members of the clergy, and in other places, they were not. Uh, the Council of Nicaea uh, seemed to reject their ordination, but uh, another church council a century later supported it. The apostolic constitutions uh, make a distinction between the liturgical roles of priests and bishops on the one hand and women deacons on the other hand. But those same constitutions say that women deacons were ordained by a bishop with the laying on of hands. We have ordination rites uh, from the Byzantine church in the eighth century that are substantially the same for male deacons and female deacons, though small differences exist. And finally, in the 18th century, a Maronite Catholic synod approved the ordination of women deacons, but the exact nature of the ordination was not clear. Now, this book will help the reader to sort through this historical evidence and to form conclusions about the past and the present possibilities. When Pope Francis 
talks about the reform in the church, he makes the point that any structural renewal in the church must have as its principal aim the mission of the church. So my question for Dr. Sagano is, how um, would women deacons contribute to the mission of the church today? What new, place, what new places could the church reach with women deacons? And could they even serve in places where male deacons cannot go? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Luke. Well, Phyllis, excellent question. How do you see women deacons contributing to the mission of the church today, especially today in the 21st century? Well, what is the mission of the church? You know, if the mission of the church is to, is to preach the gospel and to live the gospel, I think the, the first thing that would happen if a woman were ordained as a deacon, just think of it. Suppose a woman is vested proclaiming the gospel in St. Peter's Basilica. How does that help the mission of the church? What does that say about women? What does that say about what the church says about women worldwide? Mm -hmm. I mean, the church can complain all it wants about wife beating and uh, dowry burnings. But to have a woman up there and say this woman can live and be in persona Christi, can live and be in the person of Christ the servant, that says a lot. So to me, the mission of the church is for all of us to, to hear and preach and to live the gospel. And the first thing that the church can do is to live and hear and preach the gospel by you know, restoring women to that place uh, in, in, as, as ordained deacons. What about practically speaking, I mean, just women in the daily pastoral ministry yeah. in the church? I mean, you go to a parish, think about what oh. men who are ordained deacons now, but I can see there'd be some really wonderful of course. characters and characteristics yeah. of women that could be put well, to use. Well, there. you know, you know, yeah, uh, the woman who does the intake for the baptism should be able to be the one baptizing, should the pastor allow it. The woman who does the intake for the marriage, or particularly a college chaplain, yeah. should be the one able to do uh, the the uh, the marriage, funerals, you know, very very uh, uh, important particularly in churches where, you know, the priests are, are just run ragged. You have four parishes run by one priest. One of the ancient jobs of the, the deacon was to bury, was to, the, to do the funeral and, and to bury, bury the dead. Um, so uh, the, the charity of the church, uh, the liturgy of the church, uh, the word of God, uh, the, the job of the deacon is the word, the liturgy, and charity. And to insert women into this, into this cadre of ordained ministers who are connected to the bishop, part of the bishop's household, really technically a cleric is part of the bishop's household. When they bless, you know, they're extending the blessing of the bishop. By extending the blessing of the bishop to the people of God in the parish, they're really extending the blessing of the entire church of the, of the locale back to itself. I just think it's, I think it's a fabulous idea, obviously. Right, I've written right. a little bit about it. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I think it would um, today uh, really revivify, even revivify religious life, although they're totally different. Because women, I think, don't trust the men of the church hmm. and because of the, what the church says and then the way the church is um, towards this very issue, the ordination of women as deacons. Right. We have to take one more break, but when we come back, some concluding remarks from Phyllis Zagano. Please stay with us. Women deacons, past, present, future, and women in ministry, emerging questions about the diaconate, are published by Paulus Press and are available at paulistpress.com. Women deacons, essays with answers, is published by Liturgical Press and is available at litpress.org. And you can find all three books at Ben McNally's in Toronto. The uh, restoration of the female diaconate in the Catholic Church presents the possibility and the opportunity for diocesan ordinaries to add women to the permanent clergy of their diocese. Ministering perhaps must as apostolic women religious once did, and perhaps much as certified lay ministers now do. The difference is that these women, as ordained members of the clergy, would genuinely be able to share the power and authority of governance and jurisdiction in a manner not seen in the Western Church in nearly 1,500 years. Okay, Phyllis, let's say that the ancient order of women deacons is restored and the church is faced with 
the practical implementation of this? How, how would it happen? What, what would we see happening? Well, you're asking two questions, actually. Uh, it, we're not talking about the order of women deacons. We're talking about admitting women to the order of the diaconate. So if women were restored to the diaconate, how would it happen? What would do? Well, I, I have no idea what the Pope will or will not say. I, I, I don't know if he will even say anything. But should he say, uh, and I, I, have, I have written this, should he write a motu proprio saying, as my predecessors have written, there's no objection to ordaining women as deacons, you know, as the councils have said, there's no ordain. So then the principle of subsidiarity would apply. The Pope is not going to insist that every bishop in the world have women deacons. The, the Pope is going to say, well, you know, the Bishop's Conference of Canada, the Bishop's Conference of the United States, of India, uh, Selam in South America, you decide if you want women in the diaconate. If they decide they want women in the diaconate and they request it, Okay, just as now uh, a conference would request male deacons, the Irish bishops only requested male deacons about six years ago. Hmm. Um, then each bishop would decide on his own, does he need women deacons, women as deacons in his diocese? Uh, it's not something you force on somebody and it's because it needs to be organic and coming from the needs of the church. Right. If the church needs women ordained as deacons, the church will not be denied. But the church itself will know, and by that I mean the local church in Toronto or, or the local church in, in Quebec. They, they will, they will, the church will know uh, by consultation whether this is a good idea for Toronto, for Quebec, uh, or for any place else in the world. We got 15 seconds left. Do you think that this will happen? I have no idea. I think that whatever decision the Holy Father makes, it will be the correct one. Phyllis Agano, thank you very much. Thank you. The books are Women Deacons, Past, Present, Future, Women in Ministry, Emerging Questions About the Diaconate by Phyllis Agano are from Paulus Press, and you can get those at paulispress.com. And from Liturgical Press, Women Deacons, Essays with Answers, that's edited by Phyllis. You can get it online at litpress.org, and you can get all three here at Ben McNally Books in Toronto. Phyllis is Senior Research Associate in Residence and Adjunct Professor of Religion at Hofstra University in New York and founding co-chair of the Roman Catholic Studies Group of the American Academy of Religion. And you can read her academic work on her webpage, people.hofstra.edu slash phyllis underscore Zagano. Her monthly column, Just Catholic, appears in the National Catholic Reporter. That's at ncronline.org. I want to thank our guest reviewer today, Luke Hansen. He's a Jesuit priest who's pursuing a licentiate in sacred theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. And also want to thank Eric Lohr of the In Network, an online gateway for dynamic content viewed through an Ignatian lens. You can visit them at theinnetwork.org. And remember, if you'd like to see my video review of Phyllis's books on women deacons, you can visit our website, saltandlighttv.org slash subject matters, and click on the episode page with Phyllis. Thanks a lot for joining us today. We'll see you again soon. Subject Matters with Sebastian Gomes is sponsored by the Cullen family. Our Salt and Light team works hard to bring you quality Catholic programming like Subject Matters. Please consider sponsoring our mission and making a donation today. Thank you for your generosity and remember our hope begins with you.